Welcome, welcome everybody. I'm very excited. Uh, I, I was driving over here and I was so excited to host this and then I got to the door and immediately got pissed because he asked me for my ID and when I went in to look at my wallet, I did not have it. I wish that I was still under 21 in some ways, but I'm not. Um, and I was going, where the hell did I do it? I remember that um, my sister and I got so high off of weed chocolate on Saturday night that I took my ID out of my wallet and gave it to her to keep it safe. <laughs> so you guys drink up because that will make me more funny in between, um, in between the stories. Um, all right, so you guys aren't here to see me. That was all I had for about my tight uh, 30 minutes that I did for stand-up. Uh, so we'll get to the first story, Atlantic Shitty, which was written by Tom Dunn and read to be read by Nick Garner. So. I'm at a bachelor party in Atlantic City, which is basically my idea of hell. We all have matching highlighter yellow Dungeons and Dragons t-shirts, and the groom-to-be is wearing a diaper. And my friends are doing body shots off a blow-up doll that they're Eiffel Towering in the middle of a Wild West-themed bar, and everything is awful. <laughs> but I'm just going along for the ride. For some strange reason, there's a group of girls who want a photo with the groom in all of his uh, splendor. And another friend and I decide that it would be really funny to photobomb it. Because it would be. Because we're drunk, so we do. And just to make things more provocative, I give my friend a kiss on the cheek while we're photobombing, because why the hell not? But for the girls, this was one step too far. They push me away yelling, calling me a faggot, and scrambling to delete the photos before my faux gayness infects their phones forever. Why they're not bothered by the other obscene things that are being done by any of the other dozen people in the same exact terrible t-shirt of whom, some of whom actually are gay and bisexual, I have no idea. Though I guess body shots off a blow-up doll appeals across a spectrum of tastes. Uh, so these girls call me a few more colorful obscenities. And we each go our separate ways. And by separate ways, I mean about 10 feet away from each other because it's $2 drafts and a dollar Jim Beam drinks. So neither group of us is willing to abandon the bar completely. <laughs> I'm just kind of shocked overall, and I'm trying to process what happened. Again, not being gay, this is the first time that I've been hate crimed for it. And every time my wandering eyes look past them, they call me a faggot again. Meanwhile, my friends are still having their way with the blow-up doll. I have another drink. The girls mutter something under their breath. I get offered cocaine in the bathroom for about the fifth time that weekend, and my group of fr friends feigns outrage that I don't take up the offer. I have another drink, and so on, and so on, and so on, and everything's wonderful, at least as much as it can be, given the terrible circumstances. But I grew up on comic books and have a bit of a compulsion for justice, Captain America style. It's not that I'm hurt by what happened, I'm morally outraged at the idea that homophobia like that can still reign free, even if it is New Jersey. So, I decide I'm gonna teach those jerks a lesson that they'll never forget. I'm gonna pour a fucking beer on their heads. <laughs> yeah. That'll learn them, those homophobic motherfuckers, that's what you get. So keep in mind that I've been drinking for about 10 hours straight at this point. But I swear this idea sounded noble or something like that at the time. As the night wanes on, and time at this point is kind of amorphous. Uh, uh, it could have been 20 minutes, it could have been two hours, I'm not sure. Uh, but we, conco we concoct an elaborate scheme to seek our retribution. The best man, Dave, is going to rally the troops to leave the bar, and in the process, Abe is going to trip over a chair, then bump into Paul, who'll trip Jay, who'll bump Amir, who'll fall into me, and who will accidentally pour a beer on the girls as I trip and stumble into Matt at the end of this domino chain, and it's brilliant. We've got plausible deniability, and what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> One potential flaw might be that I am lacking in subtlety and stealth at that point in the evening, but after a brief consideration, we decide that that is not something to be considered a... So we move forward with the plan. Thunderbirds are go, motherfuckers. 
There's a note here that says that that is actually the trigger phrase for the plan. <laughs> That's how we know. Everyone gets into position. Dave gives the signal. The dominoes begin to fall. And I, honestly, don't wait to be touched by anyone. <laughs> These girls have really pissed me off, so I just pivot and lumber towards them like a, well, like a 200-pound man who's been drinking for 12 hours straight and is determined to dump beer on your head. I don't know how, but they saw me coming. Their leader springs into action before I even have a chance to reach them and chucks a cup of water at my head, but totally, totally misses and actually ends up hitting my friend Jay and then also drawing the intention of the entire bar. And in that moment of frozen time, I poured a beer on her fucking head and it felt so good. At least until the security guards swooped in, guns and badges exposed and glittering beneath the overhead disco ball. I stand there stunned and maybe having a mild panic attack, and I'm not quite sure what's going on until I hear that familiar sound of the girls calling me a faggot. That faggot ruined our photo! Fuck you, faggot! The ringleader screams as she squirmed to escape the guard's burly grip around her arms. He attacked us! The security chief, chief shakes his head in that disappointed way that cops are trained to do and says, I watched the whole thing happen. You threw that cup of water. It was totally unprovoked, and you're out of here. <laughs> she tries to argue and tells the chief that I assaulted her, so he asks me, did you hit her? And I, in my drunken shock, mumble something to the effect of, I don't know, I tripped, which, to be fair, was not completely untrue. The chief nods and pats me on the shoulder, and he says, you're pretty drunk. <laughs> And I agree. <laughs> and then he says, go to bed. <laughs> and the entire bachelor party in our highlighter yellow Dungeons & Dragons t-shirts stand there and watch as the girls are escorted out of the hotel. And the guards even fetch their luggage from the room that they had booked for the night. And then we all get another drink. Because karma's a bitch, but for once it worked out our way. Wow, Tom Dunn and Nick Gardner, everybody. Big round of applause. That was beautiful. I, I grew up in Southie, so I am no stranger to bar fights, but I've never in my life seen a revenge Rube Goldberg machine for a fight. That was amazing. All right, our next story is titled, What's in a Number? And it is written by Meredith Saran and read by Kamala Dullin... Dolanova, excuse me for that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Is it okay if I do this? Because, because wow. I'm also from New Jersey, so thanks for that. That was great. <clears throat> Sex used to be a very big deal to me. I never had it in high school because I knew I wasn't ready and I wanted my first time to be special. When I did finally have it, I was a freshman in college and lost my virginity to my boyfriend, a super senior who I thought I was in love with. By the time I was 25, I had only had sex with four people three of whom were serious boyfriends, and one hookup. The hookup happened in the midst of one of my many, many breakups with my on-again, off-again boyfriend with a guy I knew through mutual friends. It was awful, awkward, and so uncomfortable. He was really skinny, skinnier than any of my boyfriends. I thought he looked hot, but once he was grinding up against me, I realized the skin and bones just wasn't for me. I needed meat, muscle, flesh in between us. I also felt very large next to his small frame and not sexy at all. 
The worst part was once it was finally over, we eventually agreed to stop because clearly neither of us was enjoying it. He wouldn't let me leave. Stay, he pleaded, spend the night. I really didn't want to. Mostly because I had contacts in and I hate sleeping in them, but also because I was living with my parents at the time and I didn't want to have to explain where I was all night. Plus, I really, really had to pee. But he held me close to him, enclosing his arms and leg around me, spoon style. I had to wait for him to fall asleep to pry his sweaty limbs off of me and sneak out. His experience really turned me off to casual sex. So, just a month before my 26th birthday, I ended a serious relationship and found myself single, in grad school, in the middle of nowhere, Connecticut, and heartbroken. I knew another relationship wasn't what I needed, but the thought of not having sex again for months or years until I found another special someone freaked me out. I didn't want to wait that long, but I was scared and nervous about putting myself in another possibly terrible situation. So I did what any other sensible girl would do. I consulted my friends. At this point in time, they were the three other women in my grad class, all of whom I had met just weeks before. Since they didn't know me at all, they encouraged me to try casual sex anyway. They assured me not all experiences would be that bad, and I was bound to have some fun. So I did. Didn't really take much convincing. <laughs> First with an 18-year-old sophomore. Next with a 20-year-old, the sophomore's friend. Then some Tinder boys. Very, very few people I met in real life, and more Tinder boys. <laughs> Most were under the age of 22, but hey, I was attending school surrounded by college boys, so it was bound to happen. Most followed the typical cycle of a few dates, sex once, maybe twice, and then never talking again. And some were actually really nice guys I developed feelings for, who then either didn't feel the same way back or lived in California, and also didn't feel the same way back. That one actually happened twice. Now, all of this happened over the course of about a year and a half. And because it was all happening so quickly, I started to lose count. I'd have to go back in my head and rename all the men I had sex with in order to remember, and each time I did, I'd forget one and then have to go back. Why was the number so important to me? Well, because I was the girl who waited to be in love, to have sex. Who for so long only had sex while in committed relationships. And even though I wasn't that girl anymore, the number still meant I was a good, wholesome person. At least in my own mind. There was a time when I thought I'd never reach 10. I figured I'd be married before I had sex with 10 different people. Then I hit 10 rather quickly, <laughs> so the next number was going to be 20. Surely I'd meet the man I was going to marry by number 20. But then one night, I was making out with this guy from my high school gym class I had recently reconnected to thanks to Tinder. <laughs> and things were getting really hot and heavy and sex was clearly the next step, but I stopped it. I didn't tell him the reason at the time, but I couldn't remember my number and I needed to make sure I wasn't going to hit 20. Later on, late at night when I couldn't sleep, I decided to compile a list of all the men once and for all so I could stop questioning myself all the time. But of course, this is the social media age, so my list wasn't a document of names. It was a document of pictures I had found while stalking these guys on Facebook. And there they were, staring me in the face. All the men I had ever fucked. All white, mostly with brown hair. All 19 of them. So high school gym class boy would have been number 20. And part of me was relieved that I hadn't done it. My goal of marriage by number 20 might still come true. But then I started to really look at the list. 
and I wanted to take someone off. This was a man who sexually assaulted me. Okay, he raped me. But that word is hard to say, so I used sexually assault. And I didn't want him on my list, even though he technically belonged there. I'd had consensual, consensual sex with him before the night I was blackout drunk and woke up to him inside of me, but I hated seeing his face among all these other men I had soberly chosen to sleep with. Then I looked at some of the other men on the list who definitely entered inside of me, but only for a few seconds and neither of us came. Does that count? I don't know. I guess it counted at the time it happened because I wanted it to count. I wanted to feel like a liberated, free, independent, casual, sex-having woman. But I didn't count that boy in college who shoved himself inside of me without my consent because I quickly pushed him off of me. I didn't count that at all. I tried to forget it because was that rape? Was it sexual assault? Was it anything? I didn't count it as anything. I didn't think about it at all. And what about hot high school gym class boy? We didn't have intercourse, but we did pretty much everything else that night. And there have been others like that. Is that sex? So that's when I realized, who cares? What does that number mean anyway? Sexual experiences either mean too much or mean too little to be reduced to a number. I want to forget about the sex I want to forget about, and I want to remember and relish in the sex I enjoyed. And I'm going to. And the number, well, I'm going to hide that away in the back of my mind and go back to that blissful time when I couldn't remember. Because who really cares, anyway? I remember one of my college professors once told me never to ask a man how many sexual partners he's had. Well, let's not ask women either. Let's not even ask ourselves. Wow, I started to write so many bits um, about that, but can we give Meredith and Kamala another round of applause for that beautiful story? Um, honestly, thank you for sharing that. That was amazing. So we will bring up our next story called Pleasant Street Chronicles, Volume 1, Number 1, written by Lilia Volodina and read by Ronan Zilberman. Breaking news, a 29-year-old man suddenly lost his ability to spell. Insignificant symptom leads to an unexpected medical discovery. As it has been confirmed by multiple witnesses, a man on the brink of his 30s suddenly lost his ability to spell names, which was evident from an email he sent to his roommates on Monday night, October 26th. While he successfully managed to use the correct spelling for the first two names, the third one was certainly a challenge for him. He had added at least two extra letters in the middle and at the end. Of course, spelling a name, especially a foreign one, can be a tricky endeavor, even for the most educated person. However, that was not the reason that alarmed his roommates. Their main concern came out from the fact that he had been spelling said name correctly for the past two years. That seemed very unusual. Seriously worried about his mental well-being, the roommates turned to doctors for help in order to figure out the reason for such a drastic change in his cognitive abilities. After the series of observations and tests, doctors dismissed the theory that the roommate in question was hit on the head by a boulder or another comparably heavy object. The only other explanation 
for the mysterious change in his behavior, determined to be a severe case of latent assholism. The doctors were not able to determine how long exactly the patient had been suffering from this debilitating, debilitating, debilitating disorder. But most of them agreed that it must have been developed over the course of the last 10 to 20 years. When reached for comments on whether there might be a possible cure for this unfortunate ailment, Dr. Bustenballen provided with the following explanation, quote, Unfortunately, severe cases of untreated assholism are very hard to cure. It might take years, if not the rest of the person's life. While the condition is not deadly, it can seriously impact a person's behavior in such a way that makes them intolerable even to their closest friends and family. They often lead them to a painful, solitary existence where the only thing that supports them is the illusion of their own greatness." End quote. He also gave us a detailed description of the symptoms associated with the disease. Namely, misspelling names is only the tip of the iceberg. Other symptoms might include irrational acts such as ripping up their own things or walking around half-naked while in the presence of certain people in a futile attempt to get their attention while usually leaving some witnesses in a state of confusion. Other witnesses might find this symptom, these symptoms quite entertaining and get a good laugh out of them, which is the only benefit that assholism brings to society." End quote. When asked whether he is planning to undergo the treatments that might at least make his disease less evident, to everyone around him, the unfortunate assholic replied quite emphatically that he will do, quote, whatever the fuck he wants, the way he has always done, end fucking quotes. All right. Keep that applause going. I think my mother has untreated assholism. That woman hasn't called me the right name in like 10 years, and I'm like, you gave it to me. And it's a stripper name, Jenna. How can you forget that one? I'm gonna have to tell her about this. Ginny, she calls me Ginny. Senile. All right, uh, let's bring up our next storyteller, um, which oh, I'm getting too close to this thing, I can feel it. You're like yelling at me. Uh, the next story is Winter is Coming, written by Donna Huang and read by Meredith Saran. I couldn't have been happier when I found out Grown Up Storytime was coming to Boston. I lived in Houston for nine years before moving to Boston last July. And ever since my friend Chaya turned me on to Boo Time's Grown Up Storytime two years ago, I've been a huge fan. So you can imagine my excitement when I heard a little piece of my old home was, has found its way to my new home. Having lived in the South my entire life, moving to Boston has been a huge transition. I've got this great new job training as a doctor in rehab medicine at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in Charlestown. I found myself in this new place where buildings look different and people talk different and no one uses air conditioning. And not too long ago, I was confronted with my first real winter. We had a pretty mild winter this year, especially as everyone likes to tell me compared to the record-breaking snowfall of last year. Despite that, I couldn't hack it. On December 30th, 2015, I slipped on a patch of ice and broke my ankle. I know at this point you'd like to give me the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it was dark. Maybe it was one of those patches of black ice that blends into the asphalt. Maybe it was actively snowing and visibility was bad. No, it was a sunny but frigid day. The day before we had had our first snow of the season. A few inches of driving sleet snow blown sideways by the gusting winds that stung your face like thousands of tiny icy knives. By the next day, most of the snow had melted, 
and the patch of ice in question was fairly visible, right in the middle of an outdoor walkway in my apartment building. I was wearing these awesome winter boots that I had just bought off Amazon, complete with good traction on the soles and ghetto fabulous fur trim. So I thought I could charge through this probably, at this point, mostly water puddle. But I was wrong. It was as if Boston had opened up her arms and said, welcome to winter, bitch. Now, not only was I in this lonely concrete wilderness where the sun disappears at 3.30, you must pee, is now screaming and panically, please, 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 please pee. If I don't pee now, everyone will also know that I squatted and didn't pee. The gossip on the bus will be about how the white lady went to the trough at all if she didn't need to pee. Please pee. I wait. I see the teenage boy in my peripheral vision staring at me. Please pee. By some miracle, the mus my muscles relax just enough to allow maybe a quarter of life, liberty, and making your daily step goal on your Fitbit. <laughs> in an instant, the simplest tasks were transformed into exhausting obstacles that had to be tack tackled while precariously teetering on one leg. Before the injury, I had been trying to develop the emotional and gastrointestinal fortitude to ride the green line during rush hour without vomiting. Now, it took all of my energy to hobble the 20 feet to and from the bathroom. I had been feeling the pressure of going out and socializing, all the while worrying I was too awkward to make new friends. Now, I had to sit idly by as my new friends spent New Year's Eve gallivanting around New York City, cementing bonds and making memories, while I could only live vicariously through a stream of pictures and group chat messages. Before, I had been trying to learn a new hospital system and to prove myself at work. Now, I had to rearrange my entire schedule, missing weeks of work, which, to the neurotic type A's like me that go into medicine, is basically an eternity indefinitely posting research meetings, and perhaps the most frustrating, calling upon my fellow residents to cover for me. Since the move, I had been navigating the emotional minefield that is staying friends with a guy I had consciously uncoupled with right before coming here. As luck would have it, on the day I broke my ankle, he had bought plane tickets for us to spend a weekend together in Miami in January. When I called him to tell about what happened, I happened to catch him on his way to a date. We decided that night that maybe, not only should we not go to Miami, we probably shouldn't be friends either. For two weeks, I was pretty much trapped on my couch while I awaited surgery. Even after that, I still wouldn't be able to bear any weight on that leg for another six weeks. What had been a lingering gloomy cloud of difficulty adjusting, bloomed into a full-force thunderstorm of depression. I didn't do much during that time besides cry, yearn for a different time in my life, and plot my escape from this godforsaken place by obsessively looking up every flight out of Boston to any warm, sunny place. What felt like struggling before now felt like failing. Who was I kidding when I thought I could handle this transition with aplomb and grace? I mean, I can't even put one foot in front of the other. I returned to work mid-January, a few days after my surgery, equipped with a sexy surgical boot and one of those dorky knee scooters. And while being back in the hospital was definitely a step up from being trapped in my apartment, I was kind of terrified, particularly when it came to overnight call. At 5 p.m., all of the other doctors clock out and leave all of the patients in the hospital under the care of one resident who stays in the hospital overnight. When you're on call, you're responsible for addressing any issues that may arise, including emergencies. You're alerted to these emergencies by receiving a page that either says rapid response or code blue with the room number, which is basically doctor jargon that translates to some shit is going down, you need to get your ass here now. At which point you would run or, in my case, roll to the room in question and handle the situation. So I'm settling in for my first night on call after the injury, nervous about how the night is going to go. At around 11 p.m., I lie down in my call room, hoping to catch some sleep. Instead, I lie awake, trying not to shit my pants. 
What if they page me to an emergency and I wake up and find my scooter has rolled across the room? The floor in the call room isn't level, as I discovered. Eventually, I'm able to get somewhat comfortable and I close my eyes, when suddenly, beep, 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 rapid response. Fuck. I spring into action, leaping on my trusty scooter and rolling out, literally. I get to the room and there is an elderly man lying in bed, head lulled back, eyes closed, mouth slightly agape. What's going on, I ask. He's a diabetic, a nurse replies. He got some insulin at bedtime, but he didn't eat much for dinner because he was said he was feeling kind of nauseous earlier. His blood sugar is now critically low. I call out his name and I shake him. His eyes flutter and he moans, but nothing intelligible. Have we given any IV glucose, I ask. He doesn't have an IV. Can we get one, I ask, trying to suppress the rising knot of panic I feel in my throat. A few of us tried, but he's a really hard stick. Can you try? I should pause and say that while starting an IV seems like one of those basic things that all medical personnel should know how to do, doctors almost never place IVs. We get like one training session on it in med school where you practice on your friends, and that's about it. Basically, the only time you're expected to try to get an IV is when all of the other nurses, who have had way more experience in placing IVs than we do, have tried and failed. Because that's a system that makes sense. Thanks, Obama. So I'm nervous, but I know I don't have a choice but to try for an IV. We had to get glucose in this guy before he had a seizure, or went to a coma, or died. Yeah, seriously. Low blood sugar can fuck you up. I wheel myself over to the bedside. As I'm tying the tourniquet, I'm scanning his arms and hands for a good candidate. One stringy vein pops up on the back of his hand. It's not great, but it's probably my best shot. I pull the skin tight, like I'd been shown, and plunge the needle in. I hold my breath as I advance the IV, and then I see a flash of blood in the hub of the needle. I'm in. We push two syringes of glucose through the IV, and within a few minutes, the man started com coming to. A wave of relief washed over me. My work here was done. I pushed back with my good foot, preparing to sail triumphantly out of the room, but clunk. I backed into the patient's bedside table, sending travel-sized bottles of shampoo, mouthwash, and lotion skittering, skittering across the floor. I turned the handlebars a bit and roll forward, but I only had a few inches in front of me before, clunk, I hit the bed, push back, clunk, the table, push forward, clunk, the bed. In the midst of this 20-point turn death trap I'd wandered into, I make eye contact with one of the nurses, and we both just start to laugh. I realize that it's the first time I've laughed, like really laughed, in weeks. Sometimes, it only take a, takes a small victory to renew your hope. And sometimes, it only takes making an ass of yourself on a knee scooter to remind you that in every shitty situation, there are moments of joy and light. Adjusting to my new life here has had its challenges, and there are sure to be more. But at least, for next winter, I'll be ready to take the next step. All right. New England winters. Snow thanks, right? <laughs> Guys, that was terrible. You can tell me. You don't have, Nick, you don't have to laugh at that. Um, all right, these have all been such inspiring and funny and amazing stories um, with all pretty cool titles. But this one, the second I saw the lineup, I was like, I need to know this story right now. It is called Stall Shy. And it is written by Colleen Moore and will be read by Allison Bodsnick. I've always been a little bit stall shy. It probably started in kindergarten when a girl followed me into the bathroom and then tried to look under the stall door while I was peeing. After that, I managed to avoid public restrooms through most of my childhood simply by having bladder muscles of steel. 
Then in college, the dorms forced me to share three stalls with 12 other women, and I learned to shit right along with the rest of them, albeit still under some duress. Now I'm in my 30s and generally accepting of the need and usefulness of the public restroom. And then I decided to backpack around Asia. One of the main topics of conversation between Westerners in Asia is the condition and strangeness of their bathrooms. Squat toilets are the norm, and initially humors are on their own, simply because a lot of people suck at squatting. Fortunately for me, I grew up camping a lot, and which means I'm a master of the squat, at least by Western standards. In fact, it's the only pose in yoga that I've ever been praised for by the teacher. Not exactly glamorous, but I'll take it. And clearly it's not the squatting that gets me, it's the cleanliness, or lack thereof, and the communal toilets. That's right, communal, but I'll come back to that in a second. Another Westerner pointed out to me after a few months in China that the beauty of the squat toilet is that you don't have to touch anything. He's right. It is very important not to touch anything. It often smells and looks like someone shit on every surface in the room. I don't mean fresh feces either. I mean, it seems like months or years worth of fecal buildup. If you're planning on traveling to rural China, I recommend practicing your squat, making sure you pack clothing that will not touch the floor when you squat, and carrying toilet paper with you at all times. In Indonesia, a communal bucket of water is often provided for cleaning, <laughs> but even in China, that is the luxury. Um, that brings us back to the communal toilets. In China, there are rarely stalls, or if there are stalls, there are no doors. Sometimes the toilet is actually a long, narrow trench that you squat over, and occasionally water flushes through. The flush tends to happen at the most inopportune times, forcing you to do a one-legged squat in order to get enough height to keep from getting splashed by the raw sewage rushing beneath you. If you are unlucky enough to find yourself in the open trough style toilets, it's up to the individuals to station themselves far enough apart to not shit or piss on each other. <laughs> on, one, on one particularly long bus ride, my stall shyness was truly tested. The trip was supposed to be about 16 hours on a sleeper bus, meaning there are beds on the bus. Beds, but no bathrooms, and the drivers seem to dehydrate themselves in order to continue for eight to 10 hours without stopping once. To cope with this, I also learned to dehydrate before getting on a bus. When a bus did stop, you'd have seconds to decide if it's a bathroom break, and then quickly run to get into line. I'm guessing the driver made some sort of announcement in Chinese before the stops, because everyone else always seemed ready to depart, and I was usually the last one in line no matter what I did. On this particular bus ride, my sleeping space was a short, narrow mat on the floor that smelled of old sweat and exhaust fumes. It was the middle of the night, and I was hunkered down on my mat, happily watching a cockroach crawl across my blanket. Happy because I knew it wasn't a bed bug, so... Suddenly, the bus came to a stop. I had no idea what time it was or where we were, but I was quickly alert in the hope that this was one of the elusive bathroom breaks. As I pulled on my shoes, I watched fellow passengers exit the bus into the dark and rainy parking lot. Once out in the rain, I saw two cinder block buildings with sneaking lines of people wrapping around them. I found the line with mostly women in it. I say mostly because there was at least one teenage boy who was still following his mom to the restroom. I would say this was creepy, but I'd already witnessed multiple little emperor incidents in China and had come to expect this level of coddling. He wasn't a pervert, just a man who was still being treated like a two-year-old. When the line finally progressed enough for me to get into the building, I realized in horror that this was my nightmare bathroom situation come true. Not only was it the now infamous trough style toilet, but there were no partitions and the line of people waiting for the bathroom stood in full view of all those actually using the toilet. If you've ever waited in line for the bathroom in a bar on a busy Friday or Saturday and you've wished the lady who went in would pee a little faster, imagine if you could actually stare her down while she peed. 
That's the hell I was in. <laughs> my, my only saving grace was the fact that the lights inside the building were not working, so visibility was reduced to what the outside security light was flooding through the doorway. Given the rain, the room was only a gray glow of people squatting and pissing. There's one more important point about being a Westerner in China. We stand out. I am pale, have curly hair, and light eyes. Besides my slender stature, I'm clearly not Chinese, and this draws attention to me. People stare at me everywhere I go. I'm the only Westerner on the bus, and I'm very aware of all the eyes on me all the time. So I'm standing in line, aware that everyone is staring at me, chanting to myself, you must pee, you must pee, you must pee. <laughs> if I don't pee, I have no idea how long it will be before our next bathroom break, or if there will even be. you must pee, is now screaming and panicked play, please, 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 please pee. If I don't pee now, everyone will also know that I squatted and didn't pee. The gossip on the bus will be about how the white lady went to the trough at all if she didn't need to pee. Please pee. Hey, wait. I see the teenage boy in my peripheral vision staring at me. Please pee. By some miracle, the mus my muscles relax just enough to allow maybe a quarter of my bladder to empty. I consider it a win. <laughs> Safely back on the bus, I snuggle up with my cockroach friend and try to convince myself that this was a satisfying bathroom break. Therapeutic, even? <laughs> oh, it lived up to the title. That was amazing. I went to uh, Japan in 2010, and I got off the airplane. I had to pee so bad, so I went into the bathroom. And they have the most elaborate toilets in Japan. So I'm pushing all of the buttons, and there was one with a music note on it that I pressed, and it started playing Yankee Doodle Dandy. And this threw me into a fit of laughter. I didn't realize that like a whole group of people were in line behind me waiting to use this bathroom until the airport security came to check if I was okay. <laughs> Cause I was just hysterically laughing at a toilet. Um, that was wonderful. I would like to welcome everybody back to uh, Pleasant Street Chronicles, volume one, number two, written by Lilia Volodina and read by Ronan Zilberman. A new Picasso discovered in Brookline. One man, one picture show draws a crowd of two. Every first Friday of the month, galleries and studios located in the Soa district of Boston open their doors to the public for a night of art, exquisite wines, au revoirs, and all kinds of fun activities. Hors d'oeuvres, of course. Hors d'oeuvres and all kinds of fun activities as a part of an event aptly named First Fridays. This particular Friday was even more special since Brookline resident decided to join the ranks of Boston artists by opening his first one-man, one-picture show on the third floor of his Looney Street apartment in Brookline. Even though the number of people who came to see his highly conceptual artwork ranged between one and two, he considered his show a success and was quoted saying, I never thought my art career could reach such heights. 
It feels like only yesterday I was drawing doodles in kindergarten. Now my doodles are on the walls in my very own solo exhibit, opening on the same night as first Friday shows. I was working so hard to get where I am today. I hope this can be an inspiration for all the young artists out there." End quote. His drawing, featuring a very angular cup of a black something, complete with the text, mm -mm, she said, 1,000 times better than drugs and alcohol combined, which the artist considered to be um, a fine mix of early Picasso and contemporary com comic book art. Well, it produced all kinds of reactions from the crowd of two spectators who are also rumored to be his roommates. One expressed a mild surprise and said, I didn't know he could hold a pen, while the other gave it a look of total indifference and went on to do better things. However, did that, that did not discourage the art genius, as he was quoted saying, one has got to start somewhere. When one has a talent as uniquely undeniable as mine, it is only a matter of time until I become the next Warhol." End quote. When reached for comments on his next step, he said that he might include either two whole drawings in his next exhibit or collaborate with another, with another artist without his or her consent. Yes, dream big, Pleasant Street, dream big. All right, our next story is called Legacy of Road Rage, and it is written by Terry Delatetsky and read by Alyssa Cordero. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so short, hold on. I'm not sure what it was that made me feel so invincible inside a car when I was a kid. Sitting in the rear-facing third row back seat, affectionately called the way, way back, of my parents' wood-paneled station wagon, I spent most of those rides signaling the words, you drive me crazy, at other drivers. <laughs> and a myriad of other annoying and offensive faces and gestures. I don't know if it was the car itself or the people driving that made me feel so protected. I knew that if my parents found out what I was doing in the way, way back, which seemed to be in a different zip code from the driver's seat, their wrath would be 10 times worse than any stranger that I tortured in traffic. I come from a gene pool of beautiful hypocrites. <laughs> See, my parents were politically right-leaning independents who ran a welfare shelter out of our home and opened the door to almost anyone in need. They were compassionate people who gave the shirts off their backs to others, and yet if you crossed them or someone they loved, you would endure a consequence that your children's children would feel for generations to come. Now for this particular story, I think it's safe to say that when it comes to automobile etiquette, I come from a long line of not giving a shit. My mother and I once walked through a stop and shop parking lot when a car almost hit us. Now the driver beeped his horn and gave us that Boston scowl. And my mother smiled and mouthed, sorry, and then stealthily scratched her diamond ring along the back of the car as it passed. Additionally, my father refused to buy a car with fewer than 100,000 miles on it. And he would keep them for way, way too long. <laughs> he once had to drive home, flicking off any naysayers as we nauseously made our way home in reverse. Dad, this is crazy. You're going, one, you're going down one-way streets. And he would reply, yeah, I'm only going one way. <laughs> well, lastly, before eagle, legal age, my brother and I were both given lessons on Storo Drive. <laughs> one of the most dangerous freeway-like streets in Boston. 
Their thoughts were that sometimes you gotta throw the baby right in the pool if they're gonna learn how to swim, right? So needless to say, I fight daily against my learned habit of road rage. And I have my bag of tricks. There's the kill them with kindness trick when I smile and I wave in response and to the opponent screaming and gesturing. And the wider I smile, the angrier they get. <laughs> There's the uh, take a picture of their license plate and then pretend to call a hitman trick. Yeah. For some reason, when a driver is in the midst of emotion, taking a fake picture puts them over the edge. <laughs> I have no idea what one would even do with a picture of a license plate, but I fake it till I make it. Anyway, they usually drive off wide-eyed and deeply concerned. And then there's the teacher look, in which I follow them until we hit a red light. Then I pull up to them and I mouth, you're okay. Everything is fine. Calm down. Make a better choice. And fix your face. Yeah, yeah I don't know how I've made it this long without being killed. <laughs> One day though, I possibly took it too far and frankly, I scared the shit out of myself. So as on my way to school, the 7 a.m. commute is not that bad since it's before rush hour, but I'm usually only about three quarters of the way awake. And this day, the sun was shining so brightly on the watermarks on my windshield that I was having a hard time seeing in front of me. So I was driving slower than usual and kept trying to windshield wipe and adjust my mirrors. And on top of this, something flew in my eye, so now I'm necessarily multitasking. I felt blessed when I finally got to one of the longer red lights of my trip before turning into Harvard Square so I could have time to properly clean off my windshield and fish out whatever foreign object had flown into my eye. Then I heard a knock on my window. This was quite a surprise, seeing as that I was on a small highway road with no sidewalks, but it was this middle-aged woman with dirty, blonde, short hair and what I thought were smiling lips. So I assumed that perhaps she was telling me that my taillight was out or a random wire was hanging out of my car, so I smiled as I rolled down the window. Suddenly, her eyes turned to fire and smoke poured out of her nose as she huffed, what's wrong with you? Are you putting on makeup while you're driving? Are you psychotic? Yeah, she had a British accent, which made her seem more qualified to yell at me. <laughs> and I said, well, actually, no, I, I wasn't putting on makeup, but I, oh, but she was already walking away in the middle of my explanation, just screaming and shaking her head with a very satisfied look of victory. If there's three things I hate, it's being accused of something I didn't do, being dismissed and disappointing people who look like mothers. <laughs> Suddenly, generations of road rage poured into me and I saw red. I got out of my car, not caring that the light had turned green. I knocked on her window and said, do you see any makeup on me? Put my makeup on at school, in the children's bathroom. The mirrors are really low, like really low. <laughs> but I do it. I pressed my naked eyelid against her window and she ignored me. So I pulled out my cell phone, pretended to take a picture of her. She laughed and pulled out her cell phone and took a picture of me. Who was this beast who was using my own powers against me? Oh, in a panic, I put my face next to hers, only separated by panes of glass, and I screamed, screw you! My mother died yesterday and I am just trying to get through this day. Shame! Shame on you for making me feel like this. And she sat stunned as if she was frozen in time. These words flowed from somewhere I don't know existed in my body. They skipped my brain, they jumped off my tongue, and they left steam on her driver's side window. And I walked back to my car just <laughs> shaking and crying. And I glanced angrily in my rear view and she was looking down at her lap trying to keep that half smile, but she could not bear to look up. And I could feel that lump in her throat because I had the same one in mine. Why did I say that? My, my mother had died 17 years earlier, but still, other than that, it was a bold-faced lie. I mean, did my sick powers of inherited Jewish guilt finally get to me? I, or was it because I was newly engaged, planning a wedding without a living mother? And seriously, you try arguing with a guest who's not even alive. <laughs> and my deep grief was finally coming out to any middle-aged woman who would listen. Did I feel like it was my job to play God and teach this woman a lesson? I just, 
I felt sick at my own abuse of power. I mean, what if she just lost a child or gotten fired the day before and I made it that much worse? Was she questioning her own actions and wondering what was going to happen to me? Did my parents ever feel bad in these moments or totally justified in their insanity? Suddenly, it was like the car had melted away from me. And I, I was raw, vulnerable, and naked to every element. And I wondered again why I was so much braver and thicker skinned as a child. This is one of the many moments I wish I could call my parents, knowing that no, how, no matter how badly I was, they would scold me and lecture me, but ultimately be on my side unconditionally. It's a parent's job. And though other people say they will fight for you, there's just this unwavering, unblocked, comfortable trust that can only occur between parent and child, even a 30-year-old child. <laughs> and you know, I'm now about to marry the most gentle man in the world, someone who keeps his swearing under his breath in the car. And when I'm about to burst, he smooths his hand over my back to help me let the unimportant things roll off. But it's hard to change. I inherit the legacy of two of the most <laughs> complicated, beautiful, imp important, perfect people I have met to this day. You know, the truth is I was put in the driver's seat way too early in life, and I am still learning how to navigate. I glance again in my rearview mirror, and the way, way back, it, just, it seems miles away. Wonderful. So. I feel like that applause is for me, but it's not. Um, also, can everybody just like take a minute and just look around this room right now? Like take a minute, like turn around. This is amazing. Give yourselves a round of applause for supporting this amazing storytelling night. Excellent. And let's keep that applause going for the writers and storytellers who came up here so unabashful. Amazing. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so honored to have been asked to be a part of this night, and um, I just want another big round of applause for Coriana and Colleen for organizing all of this. Amazing. This, is, this has been a night of fun. So we are approaching our last story. Boo. I know, right? Don't worry, we'll, there'll be plenty more chances. Um, and uh, I want to reiterate that you guys can write story too and submit them, or you can read them for the next time, like Colleen said. Um, so for our last story, I'm going to ask Colleen to come up and introduce it as it's something important and dear to her heart. Colleen. All right, so this is our last story. and. I am introducing it because it's particularly important to me. The story was written by Timmy Wood, and he is one of the founders of the original Boo Town in Houston. He passed away very unexpectedly last week. So all of the grown-up story times, so uh, Houston, LA, Boston, we're all doing tributes to him in different ways. So we are reading one of his original stories. Uh, so I hope that you enjoy this last story. It's called The Rapture. It's by Timmy Wood. It's being read by Ethan Rubin. And uh, it's a little piece of Timmy's life that's a bit crazy. So I hope you enjoy it. When I was young, my parents thought it would be a good idea to put me in a school that was not a public school, because this was a church private school. Which is like, the people of church, they start a church and they have kids and they're like, uh, we don't want to send our children into the world to be, you know, tainted with evolution and books. Let's start our own school. So they started their own school. I went to Livingstone's Christian School from kindergarten until 12th grade. In my sixth grade year, I had this teacher named Mrs. Barrow, and Mrs. Barrow was fucking crazy. 
I pray to God she's not teaching anymore. She was obsessed with weird shit. She was obsessed with angels. And she claimed that she had a guardian angel that followed her around, and his name was Charlie. And she would also tell us that we shouldn't use slang because angels don't understand us when we talk if you use slang. Angels don't understand what it means to say, yeah, I'm cool for Christ, because then the angel says, earlier he said he was hot for the Lord. What's up with that? This lady was crazy. She also told us that whenever you see something out of the corner of your eye, she would say, when you see something out of the corner of your eye, boys and girls, that could be an angel or a demon. <laughs> One thing that she loved even more than angels and demons and crazy fucked up shit like that, she loved the book of Revelations and the rapture. Now, if you aren't familiar with what the rapture is, it's when God goes, you know what? Let all those people who believe in me, let's take them up to heaven and everyone else Let's have them have the worst fucking time of their life. So basically, everyone who's a Christian goes to heaven, and then on earth, there's wars and tribulations and scorpion monsters attack. It's horrible. She taught that shit for a month. We didn't have class for a month. And all she taught was the rapture. She was obsessed that it was going to happen any day. She would come in and say, sign of the end times, boys and girls. This is happening in the Middle East. Sign of the end times. You know what? I'm not even going to assign homework tonight because the rapture will probably happen tonight. No homework. <laughs> and she had these videos she would show us, these really cheap, low-budget movies that I've come to realize now were horror films. <laughs> One week, we canceled everything, even rapture talk, to watch these movies. There were four of them and they were each like three hours long. I was a young, impressionable child, sixth grade, watching these movies and hearing all this rapture talk really fucked me up, like big time. In these movies, people were getting their heads cut off with the guillotine if they didn't take the mark of the beast. It was scary. I became obsessed with what happens if the rapture happens and I'm not one of the chosen ones. It plagued me. I would like lie in bed at night and I would hear my parents talking in the living room and if they took a moment to pause and stop talking, I had to rush out and make sure they were still there. Oh, thank God, the rapture didn't happen. I'm safe, I'm sorry, God, I'm, so I'm sorry. Then one day, I went to the grocery store with my mom and my sister. We came home and my mom was like, Tim, why don't you go get the mail? Because the mailbox was across the street. And I was like, okay, getting the mail is fun. I'm in sixth grade. I go get the mail, and I walk back to the house, and I'm like, Mom, I got the mail, I got the mail. And I walk in, and no one's there. And I was like, that's weird. I... They were just here. I could have sworn I saw them walk back in the house. I look in all the bedrooms. They're not in the bedrooms. I look outside in the backyard. They're not in the backyard. I look down in the front yard, they're not in the front yard, they're not down the street, I'm looking everywhere. They are nowhere to be found. My first thought was, holy shit, the rapture just fucking happened. <laughs> Minus the expletives, because in case it didn't happen, I didn't want to curse and then not go. <laughs> so I'm like, the, the rapture happened, I'm, I'm stuck here. And I then I didn't know what to do. Should, should I board up the windows? Should I go on the run? I can't take the mark of the beast. Oh God, there's gonna be an Armageddon. Scorpion monsters are gonna attack me. Oh man, I started freaking out. Why did they not take me? Why was, why was I not taken in the rapture? God, what did I do? And then I realized that God had forsaken me. He had taken everyone else in sixth grade, I get on my knees, crying and bawling and cursing God for not taking me in the rapture. What did I do? What did I do? I went to church. I, I went to Christian school. I went with my sister. Why was I not taken? Now I'm going to have to get my head cut off. <laughs> and then my mother walked in the room. Of course, I'm crying. I'm so glad you're here. I thought the rapture happened and I was left behind and don't make me take the mark of the beast on my forehead. I'm so glad you're here and the beast united all the nations. <laughs> but now I'm glad that it happened 
because if it hadn't happened, I would probably still be really scared of the rapture. And now that, for 15 minutes of my life, I kind of lived it, if the rapture does happen and I'm not taken, I'll be prepared. <laughs>